Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malt House Games Podcast. My name is Delton. I'll be your host today. And with me, as usual, is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. And I'm melting. Why are you melting? Because it's 109 degrees outside today, baby. I think it was only like 106, but it was 109, my car said, sitting in the sunlight. So it, we are having a heat wave this week in Oklahoma, America, and it's perfect timing because we just got back from the cold embrace of Alaska. Yes, we are back. I forgot about that. We are back now uh, from our trip to Alaska on the cruise, which was all in all fantastic. We got to see glaciers for the next four and a half minutes as they're actually still here. Yes, the glaciers were amazing. The nature was beautiful. We got to see a humpback whale completely breach and jump out of the water like five or six times and no one else seemed to be around for it. We staked our claim early in the day. We got prime real estate on the uh, port side of the boat where they were parking in front of the Johns Hopkins Glacier as well as the John Muir Glacier, as well as this little humpback whale just breaching, having a good time, greeting us in the morning time, saying hello world, and we said hello back. We really did. It was awesome. The uh, Glacier Bay National Park was absolutely phenomenal and had some of the most beautiful views and just gorgeous nature that you don't get to see any other way. We sat out on the deck for eight hours straight listening to naturalists and rangers talk. We didn't have any kind of cell service or anything like that. We just sat there and watched and wrote and listened and watched and wrote and listened and were just so mindful in the moment. Mindfulness is very easy whenever you're in Alaska. There's no work to it. You are forced to be present. Yes, if you are on the uh, deck of the ship and you are being purposely mindful and looking at nature and enjoying the outdoors, it's just impossible not to be mindful, impossible not to take in incredible sights the entire time. You know, part of mindfulness is a state of acceptance. And our very first full day on the ship, my sister, who had cell service, got word that there was an earthquake off the side of the Alaskan coast, which led to a tsunami warning. And so I have never been more terrified and more at peace in my entire life. And in that moment, whenever I realized there is nothing I can do, there is nothing I can do on that boat. So again, it was that forced mindfulness, that forced acceptance of where I was. We did not get overturned by a tsunami. We made it back alive, as far as I remember. Hiked Mount Juno, ate good food, saw lots of sea critters, and just had a grand old time. Well, we didn't hike the whole Mount Juno. We hiked about half. We got about halfway up it, and Haley over here could have just do 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 all the way to the top. But me and Riley were absolutely dying, and it's not so much we were dying from uh, it being a very hard hike because it was. It was more the fact of uh, pretty bad knee pain and back pain was starting to set in, uh, which made us very aware that uh, it was we were overdoing it and probably would have been hurt by the time we got down if we did the full hike. And I was very bear aware because I went to Ace Hardware and bought bear mace and was ready to go. Never saw a single bear, which is good. Not we didn't. Not complaining about that, but I accepted my fate of turning back around and went a solid four miles, which I'm very grateful for. Gorgeous sights, gorgeous views. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Makes you feel very tiny and very, I don't know, just the whole week I just felt mindful and at peace. It was a very centering trip full of a lot of exploration, reflection and beautiful views. I am glad to be back, though. Not happy for the 109 degrees Fahrenheit. No, not at all. But I'm also glad because we're coming back to hot weather and very cold beer. We definitely are. Do you want to start with the first beer here? I do want to start with the first beer here. Uh, which one? Let's do Stone Cloud. All right. So the first beer today is going to be from Stone Cloud Brewing out of Oklahoma City. We're going to see if this will redeem Stone Cloud in our eyes. Stone Cloud isn't bad. Just, stone Cloud is okay. Every Stone Cloud beer I've had just tastes like the introductory version of that particular beer. If I have an IPA, it's a very light IPA. If I have a pale ale, it's a very light pale ale. If I have a stout, it's a very light stout. I feel like if you were trying to introduce somebody to craft beer, you take them to the to uh, Stone Cloud. I and mean, again, it's good beer. I haven't I can't complain too much about it, but for me, it just tastes like the light version of every one of the styles. Let's see if this one changes our mind. This is this one is actually a different one. What is it, Del? It's a is it a wit? 
Was that this one? I can't remember. I, I bought two beers today. So the beer, this first beer, is from Stone Cloud Brewing, like I said. It is Neon Passion, which is a Belgian wit with passion fruit. Uh, it is a 5.5 alcohol by volume and a 12 fluid ounce can. It says liquid summer love. Uh, let's see if I can find more information on it. Uh, please recycle. That's pretty much it. There's no like flavor descriptors or anything like that. I totally bought sale beers today. I got two six packs and a single. So actually I bought one six pack. I did a create your own six pack of the six beers that were left over in the create your own six pack, all of the same, which we'll review that one coming up in October. But I bought, uh, what ended up being two six packs and a single for only 14 bucks. So I did some bargain yep. shopping today. This was half price. Can't complain about that. So as long as it's drinkable, it's worth the money. Even if it's half drinkable, it's worth the money. But yeah, so a Belgian wit, traditionally a wit, it's essentially a white. It's a lighter beer. Uh, a lot of Belgian beers, wits included, usually have something along the lines of coriander and like lemon peel, or not lemon peel, orange peel, that kind of spice. You know, a very traditional, uh, like a shock top is a shitty version of a Belgian beer, whether it be a like a standard Belgian ale or a wit. But uh, yeah, so this is a Belgian wit with, what did I say? Passion fruit. It's very cloudy. Very cloudy. It smells interesting. It smells like passion fruit. Quacks like passion fruit. Does it taste like passion fruit? Probably not. It's okay. <laughs> it tastes more like fruit juice than beer. I don't really think I taste beer. I taste, I taste passion fruit juice with a little bit of coriander. Yep, they did the Belgian wit thing with the coriander orange peel, added passion fruit. And I think my thing, you know, not to dog on Stone Cloud all the time, but at the same time, I'll tell you my thoughts on beers when we have them. Uh, to me, like you said, Stone Cloud's always the introductory. I always feel like Stone Cloud's base level beer in terms of like, if this beer was a Belgian wit and all they did was add passion fruit, I just feel like the Belgian wit is thin. Yes, very Not necessarily thin. watered down, but it's thin. It could be more robust in most ways. Like, I feel like if you're, you're st let's say on a one to 10 scale, like your, your standard Belgian wit's a five, theirs might be a two. If your standard IPA is a five, theirs might be a two. Yeah, that's in general, in most cases. And I think that that's my main problem it's not that their flavors or their ideas are bad it's just it doesn't have the it doesn't have the i don't know what the, the term is the the the, the presence the mouthfeel it doesn't have the impact i'm looking for yes this just again tastes like passion fruit with a little bit of coriander in it now it's good it's very refreshing but i feel like yeah. i'm drinking fruit juice and this can be this can be very dangerous not gonna lie for We're, sure i could totally break open the rest of that six pack in my little kitty pool this weekend and have a grand old time but we're not going to do that because we nope. need to record this here podcast. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, so this beer is not too bad, but that's Stone Cloud out of Oklahoma City. One day we're going to have a Stone Cloud beer that blows our minds. And we're like, this is fantastic. It's the best beer I've had all year. And I'm just, I'm waiting for it. I'm going to try every Stone Cloud till we find it. To be continued. To be continued. But, yes, let's move into the game and get this going forward. Oh, here's the door. Uh, uh. It's straight ahead. It's it's a game. So the game for today. By the way, we never said that A, we're the Malthouse Games podcast. <laughs> we do board games and beer. This is episode 150. We are kind of out of practice. It's been about a month since we recorded, since we, we recorded uh, two episodes in a row right before we left for our trip. So that because we got back the day the episode released. So we're a little bit out of practice, a little rusty, knocking the rust off. Yes, it's it's strange. And I also so we uh, our internet last week went out completely, and we have internet through Cox Communications, and I called them, scheduled an appointment, and was just kind of fed up with it being down, and also AT&T just got installed in the neighborhood for fiber, and so I called, a, or uh, I went online, looked at AT&T, saw the different benefits and bonuses they're offering to switch in our neighborhood right now, and I switched, and instead of having Cox come out and fix their internet on Friday, I just waited and, you know, gritted my teeth and worked through the weekend with no internet until Monday. And we now have fiber at the same speed with free installation, $200 worth of gift cards, and uh, half the price a month. It was all worth it for having to live like the pioneers for five days with no internet. It really wasn't that bad because we just changed our phone plans to what's going to end up saving us money, but we get un completely unlimited, unlimited data. They don't yeah. slow it down. Yeah, so that's why 
We're recording this podcast about four and a half minutes before we go to Elk City, America. Yes. But we are the Vault House Games Podcast. We're a podcast <laughs> all about tabletop, beers, games, alcohol, drugs, propaganda. Where, where are we about, Dalton? Board games. Board, board games, games and beer. Board games and beer. And so today, the board games and beer we are talking about is Black Angel. So before Haley ruined what I was going to say last, <laughs> I had to completely move my desk, and I decided to take it as an opportunity to clean out and clean off my desk. And then we've mounted my two monitors, one of which I flipped to be vertical, and I find I really like it. And I've reorganized, and I moved my soundboard. I'm no longer going to leave all the mics and stuff plugged in 24-7. I'm going to have to basically redo it every time. Uh, but it's going to give me a cleaner setup, and that's also taking us getting used to and it's just, everything is new. Everything is new. I don't know what to do, but it's fine. But yes, the game for today is a game I purchased at Gen Con in 2018. Yes, 2018. Because it was uh, the Gen Con, no, I'm sorry, it was 19. It was the one where you weren't with me. Oh, that's right, because I, uh, I did a, what was it, the, the reveal, whenever you brought your Gen Con haul, and I got yes. to take a gander at it and give my first impressions. And also, its brother was Tonto Corey. <laughs> of that haul, yes. So yes, 2019, whenever I volunteered with the TKG crew and stayed with them, I picked up Black Angel because I was very excited about it. The designers of Black Angel are Sebastian Dujardin, Xavier Jorges, and Elaine Orban. Those are the same three designers behind Twa which is a game from Pearl Games, the same publisher as this one. Uh, and I love Twa, even though I honestly couldn't tell you how it plays right now. It's been so long. Uh, but I wanted this game so badly. It looked beautiful because of the illustrations and graphic design by Ian O'Toole. Uh, if you know illustrations and graphic design in the board game world, Ian O'Toole is phenomenal. This graphic design also matches our beer can. It kind of does today. Uh, the development and editing of the French rules is Renaud Eloy, and translator for the English rules is Nathan Morse. So Black Angel, like I said, is by the same designers of Twa, so it shares a few characteristics. However, I haven't played Twa in so long, like I said, I couldn't tell you what those were. So we're just going to talk about Black Angel as its own 100% game, which it is anyway. Black Angel is a game all about... Uh, different artificial intelligence. This is kind of weird for the conversations of today. You are playing, each player is playing an artificial intelligence and you are helping run this ship, the Black Angel, through space, heading toward Spes, S-P-E-S, -E which is the dumbest name for a planet. Spes, which is basically Earth. Uh, and you're trying to get the ship there. You're trying to establish colonies as you go. And that's pretty much it. That's the, the story of the game. If you look at the game board, it seems extremely complex in a weird way. It seems like there's a lot of random stuff going on, but I promise you, which as Haley can attest, once you've learned the rules and got about halfway through the game, it's actually a fairly simple game. Well, not simple. It's not as hard as it at first appears. I played this very sleepy, but very successfully. She did. Uh, so the game has a few different areas that we'll talk about kind of separately. Uh, we have the main game board. We have the space board, and we have the player board. So to start this all off, there's going to be a space board. The space board is a row of these kind of chevron pattern tiles. They're these little, you know, v, little V tiles. They all slot together. They're hex shapes. If you just took a look at it, you'd know what I mean. Um, but essentially, you've got this, these tiles, and the black angel figure sits in the very center of the center one. During the game, you're going to have the ability to take your little robots, put them in a spaceship, and shoot them out onto the space board to, uh, to be able to move them around and put them on different spaces, playing a card there, depending on the color of space you're at and everything like that, putting a card there, potentially encountering enemies, and then providing now a new action for as long as that remains on the space board or providing some sort of benefit whenever it falls off of the space board, which I can explain. During the game, you're going to have two different things you do on your turns. You're either going to take a, the, not, I guess not on your turns, you have two types of turns you can take. You're going to either take sequence A or sequence B. Sequence A is basically your usual turn, and sequence B is a reset. A sequence B is I am out of dice. Your dice in this game are your workers. When you run out and you don't have the funds to buy from your opponents or you don't want to buy them from your opponents, 
you do sequence B. It's a reset. You're going to re-roll the dice that you need. You're going to reset your player board. And then you're going to advance the Black Angel towards space. And now when the Black Angel takes one step forward on this, the very back piece of the space board, you're going to remove, flip it, put it in the front of the space board, and slide the whole space board back to the spot it was in. Now space has changed. You've left a strip of space behind as you head towards space. I hate that. Space. Earth. Head towards the Earth-like planet. Uh, so what that means is if there are cards on that row of space that are going to go away as you move towards Earth, then the, uh, those cards are going to fall off and become potentially, uh, they're going to buff your late game or in-game scoring if you've put anything towards in-game scoring, but they also potentially have a benefit such as more robots for free, spaceships for free, uh, resources for free, debris for free, whatever you're going to be getting. So that's the space board. It's a you're moving around, putting some cards down. The cards are going to fall off, gives you a bonus, that kind of stuff. You also then have your player board. Your player board is interesting because it's a three by three grid. Uh, the three by three grid is where you put your technologies. Uh, on the beginning of a turn, when you're just taking your normal sequence A, your normal turn, uh, next to the left side of that grid and the bottom of that grid, so six total spaces, you can put a card and activate the technologies in that column or row that it's next to. If you play a yellow card, you activate all the yellow technologies. If you put a blue card, you activate all the blue technologies. A green card for green, or if a red card, which are the, what are they called? Ravager, the enemies. If you play a red card, it activates every technology in that row or column. Now, the game is very, very specific about colors. It's yellow, blue, and green. Those are your colors. The dice you're going to have, yellow, blue, and green. The spaces those dice go to, yellow, blue, and green. The cards you're playing, yellow, blue, and green. The spaces on the space board that you're going to place those cards, yellow, blue, and green. The uh, technology tiles, yellow, blue, and green. Everything in this game is focused on colors. If you use a yellow dice to take a yellow action, you must, uh, in space, you must place a yellow card on a yellow space. So it's all very much dictated by the color in which you play, unless you play with the advanced variant where the technology tiles have a one-time bonus, such as ignore the color or uh, ignore the value of a dice or something like that. A die, I guess I should say. So the player board is where you put technologies down. Uh, you're going to be activating those technologies to get you bonuses, get you more resources, whatever you need. You can also slot new technology in. Uh, and for an easy example, if you have one of the columns, if the topmost has a technology tile and the middle has a tech tile, but the bottom one does not, when you buy a new tech tile, you slot it in from the bottom or the left and it slides in. So in this uh, column, in this example, you have the top and middle full, but not the bottom. It slides into the bottom. Later in the game, let's say you want another, no Haley, let's say you want another technology tile, you will slide it from the same starting point and it will push the bottom one to the middle, the middle to the top, the top one off of your player board. So you have this interesting little puzzle sometimes of like, I want this row to stay the same, but if I want to put anything else in this, uh, in my player board, I'm going to end up sliding it out. And I enjoyed that sliding puzzle aspect, even though I feel like I didn't really utilize the tech tiles as much as I should have. Go ahead. That's what she said. How dare you? I feel I'm just going to say it as a blanket statement because there are like nine different times that you could apply that. I, well, the big one that I looked at you and I noticed what you were doing was the slide it into the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a great, I mean, that's just it's great. It's a pretty great one. I set you up for that. Yes. So we have, we have the space board where you're moving your little aliens, or, uh, aliens, your little robots around in their spaceships, placing cards down for future actions, things like that. You've got your player board where you're slotting in your technologies that give you bonuses. If you're playing with the advanced variant, which I highly recommend, then you're going to have one-time bonuses on some of those tech tiles if you would like. Then you have the main player board. The main player board is where you are going to see what dice you have available. It's where you're going to use robots to be able to get more dice in a future turn. It's where you're going to actually select your action. And it's going to be where you see which Ravagers are attacking the Black Angel, which is the ship that you're technically on. Uh, the main player board looks complex at first glance but really it's fairly simple. In the center, there is the stock of robots that you get to start off with. Then you have quadrants that dictate, hey, here's your dice. 
And then you have the action places. You've got yellow, which has the action of moving a spaceship in space or buying a tech tile. Blue, you can move a spaceship in space or you can repair damage. Green, you can move a spaceship in space or you can defeat the Ravagers on the ship. Those are the entirety of the actions in the game. So all of this other shit I've talked about, the space board with all its putting things down and blah, 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 and the player board with its tech tiles, all of it stems from the Black Angel main board and these four total actions. There's only four. There are three different colors, and one of the, the one repeated action is in all three colors, but that's it. So when you're making a decision in this game, that's one of the things I liked is you're like, well, I have a blue dice left. I have blue and green as my dice. I get to pick blue and green. What do I want to do? Do I want to go to space? I can do that with either one, or do I want to do the other two things? And then you look at the value of your die because, like I said, in this game, the color matters. The next thing that matters after color is the value of the die. It goes between zero and three because each pip higher, one, two, or three, is going to allow you to do a stronger action. If you're moving in space, guess what? A three lets you move up to three, where a one only lets you move one. If you're going to destroy Ravagers, guess what? You can destroy one with a value one and two with a value two. If you're going to repair damage, same thing. One with one, two for two, three for three. Tech tiles. Uh, the tech tiles cost different amounts. It's mostly two, and then a few can get to one if nobody buys them too often. So if you're putting a three on the tech tile action space, you can buy a two and a one. If you put a one down, you got to hope there's a one there or else you can't buy anything. So it is not really as complicated once you get used to it. Get used to the fact there's four total actions. You're going to do those actions a lot, especially moving in space. And that's, I mean, there's a lot here. And I know I've explained a lot of random shit, but all of it comes down to you pick a die based on color. You pick one of four actions or one of two for each color, even though one of those is shared between all of them. And then you do that action, which could correspond to the space board and your player board. Uh, and then you go to the next player and you do that until you have to reset, move the black angel and then keep going. You don't all reset together. You can do it at different times. You can reset early if you pay a point penalty for having uh, high values, whatever values of dice left over, things like that. But that's really the whole gist of the game. And I know I said a lot of things. I feel like, you know, because it's about artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. And the actions very much feel like you're programming your next move. You have to have the right color and the right number to perform X, Y, and Z actions. Yeah. If you don't have those and you can't perform those actions, it's just like, you know, writing code of some sort. Yeah, I could see that. It's sort of programming, even if not. It's like putting, no. putting things in space is kind of programming because you're getting future actions. You're programming new things in to do. But I see what you're saying. It's trying to, like, mimic that. Yeah, it's, try it's trying to mimic, like, you have to have the right combination of things in order to get the the action or the task that you want to do, the right commands. Yes, I could see that for sure. Um, now, there are ways to uh, modify your dice, and I can't remember which one it is. Uh, it's the, yes, you can flip a dice, a single die over by spending one of your debris cubes, uh, which you get by repairing damage off the ship. You can flip one of those over, uh, flip a die over for one debris cube, or you can give somebody else a resource and buy one of their die to use, forcing them to have to reset their turn before you, and you can potentially take a high-value die from them. But that's pretty much the game. What I liked about this game, so I played this solo first, which never happens, but Haley was having to work one day, and I was bored out of my mind, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to break out a game that I can finally get off the to-be-played shelf. Needs to be done. And so I got this down, read the rules, read the variant for Solitaire, had a few questions I had to clarify online. It wasn't the clearest for Solitaire. If you treat Solitaire like a two-player game exactly, or if it's like slightly different or what, but all in all, it was pretty simple. It's hard to beat the Solitaire. Uh, Hal is the name of the uh, opponent in Solitaire, which is very, very fitting, which Hal was the name of the AI system in 2001 Space Odyssey, which we saw two references to this one, weekend. One in Barbie. One in Barbie. And the other in uh, Everything, Everything Everywhere All, All at, at once. once. Yep. We watched Barbie and Oppenheimer. Barbenheimer. In a double feature. 
Uh, Barbie first, Oppenheimer second, which was a mistake, but the only way to do it with the SDX theater. Both were about existential crises in their own way. That's true. And then we came home and watched Everything Everywhere All at Once, which I don't think Riley much cared for. We tried. We tried. We loved it. Uh, I loved it on second viewing, I should say. We loved it on first viewing as well. But yes, uh, Black Angel, it's, it's this, just this interesting game about picking a color and making the most of it. I felt, feel like for as limited as the actions are, just having four actions, each one uh, has a, a series of things that happen from it. Right, you pick the I'm gonna do. I'm gonna attack the Ravagers, and then you figure out, okay, how many Ravagers are there? What's the value of my die? How many can I attack here? Blah blah blah. And it's like fairly simple. The bigger one is the moving your ship in space because it's like I'm gonna go to space. I have a two. I have to take a robot, and I have to take one of my spaceships, and I put it in space. I can move up to two. Now I have to have a card that matches the color. You don't have to, but now I have to have a card that matches the color of the space I ended on to put down. And I put this guy here, I take another robot to set on it, and now I have control and a robot and a ship on there. I get a few points, and I either get something when it falls off the space board, or I get uh, auto access to this action or something. Like, it's it's fairly complex little chain of events that happens with each, uh, each action, but all in all, they're fairly simple. The thinking is straightforward. I feel like that the strategy becomes apparent once you get how to play down. And what I like is, you know, as you're saying, the space board starts to move and starts to change. It almost looks like you're leaving things behind, like you're you're leaving space junk. You're leaving little, you know, critters, little AI robots behind to do your bidding. And so I really like how that is visualized on the board. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So, the topic of today's episode is one that I came up with, but I'm probably going to butcher. It is crazy, interactive, fun board things. <laughs> well, I know that was a perp. Ah, oh, God. Oh, got a party foul. No, we didn't. It didn't spill. You got it on your pants. This is why you don't buy budget <laughs> beers. They're always overcarved. <laughs> this has been in the fridge, too, and so it shouldn't be this. I mean, I guess it's warmed up a bit, but it still shouldn't be this carbonated. Holy hell. My God. No wonder that they were clearancing it. That's a big head right there. Don't talk about me like that. Oh, by the way, speaking of big heads, uh, Dalton and I went to go try on motorcycle helmets this week because we're contemplating getting our motorcycle license. And we go into a, a store, and they have plenty of small, medium, and large helmets. But it turns out Dalton and I are <laughs> on the complete opposite sides of the spectrum in that go ahead. I'm an extra small. And Delton is... I'm either an extra large or a double extra large in motorcycle helmet. Yes, at one point he handed him an extra large to try on and it sat on top <laughs> of his head like a toy. I pulled it down just a little and I went, nope. And he went, nope. And I just handed it back. It, of course, to be fair, that was also like a $1,500 helmet that is no way I would buy that. No way. But yeah, that's how we learned out. Maybe if we were to have a child, it'd actually be normal. Maybe they have a medium head. Maybe. Because he gave me a small and I could spin it around on my head like a top. And he's like, it's supposed to squeeze your cheeks. So I'm like, well... I got some big cheeks, but I got a little head. This next beer for today is from Vanessa House Beer Company in Oklahoma City. Uh, this is General Buffoonery. It says Spice, Bright, Prost. It is a Hefeweizen Ale. Uh, 12% alcohol by volume, 5, uh, sorry, 12 fluid ounce can, 5.2% alcohol by volume, and 12 IBUs. Is it general or general? General. General. This is like, this is... General buffoonery. I was taking it as like general, like a soldier. And I was like, there's a clown on it. Like, what the heck are you talking about? Who's your about? commanding officer? Hello, I'm General Buffoonery. It's like Major Pain. Major Pain. No, this is general, general buffoonery. Isn't it the same general and general? Aren't they spelled identically? I don't know. I'm having an existential crisis right Go now. Google it. Google it while I'm finishing reading the can. Look up the difference between a general of the military and general. I don't know how to define general as in something that's general. Uh, anyway, this is Vanessa House. It says, you may have heard, oh, wow, this text is hard to read. You may have heard us say it before, but it never hurts to reiterate that we are about fun. That typically leads to various shenanigans, hijinks, or nonsensical antics. Some might say we engage in general buffoonery most of the time, but enjoy this tasty brew and create a memory you can laugh at later. Okay, I found a six-minute video on how to pronounce them differently. I kind of don't want to splice that into this podcast right now. <laughs> 
general and general. So I want to say that the way to tell them apart is context clues, and that if the can has a clown on it, it's probably not general as in military. Yeah, Haley. It's probably not with this little freaking clown over here and like a, a seal, and then I don't know what the shit that's supposed to be. I don't know if that's supposed to be some kind of weird elephant. No, that's like a cannon that you shoot the clown out of. Oh, I see. So look, I thought it was like a pig at first. That's Maybe it is tail. a general. There's a cannon on it. Oh, uh, Jesus. Military. It's General Buffoonery who's always u- doing General Buffoonery. Should be <gasps> General General. General General. Do I go to him to save some time? Yes. <laughs> Online. <laughs> go to the general and save some time. So this beer. Very clear. It's, uh, it's, uh, that's pretty hazy. What are you talking about? Oh, mine's pretty clear. Yours oh, is hazy. Mine's pretty hazy. Definitely smells like a Hefeweizen. It does. It's always it's a, a, hef, a Hefeweizen's, uh, it's got a little, like, always reminds me of like a weedy beer. It's always got a little bit of like wheat kind of tang. To me, it smells like a beer and some of those cheap popsicles that come in the plastic wrapper, like the little push-up popsicles. That's, that's a weird, I don't know who smells their popsicle. You always do whatever you eat something. <laughs> that's what she said. <laughs> uh... You know, this podcast is full of okay. It's fine. It's fine. For as heady as that was, it's pretty flat. <laughs> that, it was on the budget shelf, I'm telling you. It was. It was a dollar beer, my friend, and we are getting a dollar beer flavor. Yeah, it's fine. The aftertaste is aftertaste is kind of meh. Have we lost our taste buds, or is it the beer? That's my question. Did Alaska ruin us? No, I think I just bought <laughs> three beers. Like I, I bought a total of... Math, 13 beers and spent $14. So this is probably yeah. my doing. Yeah, we had a few Alaskan beers while we were in Alaska. Most of them were pretty good. There was a couple that were just okay. My favorite was the super piney, pine hoppy one. But I've also discovered I really like piney hops. We also had a beer in uh, Vancouver, too. Mm-hmm. Stanley Park Brewery, right? That was at the airport. We had another one at that little cafe down in Vancouver that we had a drink at. We did. I can't remember yeah. the name of it. I don't, like 42nd Street for me or something like that, maybe. I don't know, but they had some decent beers. Alaskan beers weren't bad. I wish I could have got to sit and try a flight, but we didn't get to go to a brewery because they were all a little far from the ports. And then Vancouver, I would have liked to see more of Vancouver, but we were also very tired, and it was a lot of walking, and it was kind of hot. It was just a whole thing. So now we have a plan. Go back to Juneau and do that full hike and go to Vancouver and spend a couple days hanging out in Vancouver and checking out the rest of the city. Yes, and we also have a plan to probably make Delton splice this podcast to where it's all a bit more linear because we've nope. been all over the place this nope. episode. Nope. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back. Well, the good thing is we have to record the next one here in probably a few days or so. So we've knocked the rest off. We'll record the next one next and then week, we'll, yeah. we'll build up a lot more rest before our 152nd episode comes out at the end of the month. We need uh, one of the things I'm going to mention before we get into the topic. Uh, we had talked about changing things up at episode 150 and we're here and we don't have any good ideas of what to change up. <laughs> and so instead we're just going to change up the entire order of the podcast by making it where we're talking about the game mixed in with the banter. That's not what happened at all. Everything's fine. We'll figure something out though. I mean, you'll hear about it. <laughs> Everything's fine. So the topic for today is interactive boards in a board game. Haley had this idea because in Black Angel, like I said, you have the Black Angel, or sorry, the space board, where the Black Angel is in the middle and it's heading towards Spes, the Earth-like planet. And whenever you do your sequence B turn, where you're resetting your dice and everything, uh, like I said, the ship is going to move one forward, and then the last row is going to flip over and move to the front. So it's a, it's a, g- a gentle interaction. It's nothing absolutely crazy, but that progresses the game because the game is over when either all of the bad Ravager cards have come out of their deck or if the Black Angel has reached Spes, that Earth-like planet. So that little bit of interaction on the board, though, honestly, I think is like such a neat way to present movement because even though the Black Angel is always in the same spot in those uh, you know rows of boards, the boards still move and change and uh, new stuff comes out, old stuff goes away. And it was just like a neat little little addition. It takes up a shit ton of table space, but it's a neat addition and I find it to be very fun. So what about that was entertaining for you that you liked uh, to make you want to do it as a topic? I just really liked how it looked like the ship was moving and leaving things behind. 
and it made it a little bit interactive, but really what it did was it moved along the gameplay. It gave a visual representation. We're on this ship. We're moving forward in space. We're leaving some things behind that we don't need or that we're using to colonize other planets, so on and so forth. And so I really feel like that's what sets this game apart from everything else. Is that's the thing that I remember the most from this game. Really? Yeah. Like, I, I know how to play. I remember how to play. I can't describe it as well as Delton can because of the person that I am. Well, neither can I by the order of everything. <laughs> but that's what I remember most about this game is how how the board changes and how that shows the progression of the game. Because once you move that seventh tile, the game is over. And so it also helps you to know how far along am I in the gameplay. I do like, too, that uh, they have a little baby token for that Earth-like planet space. And whenever that uh, like row falls off, and flips over, you put the big planet right there in the center. So it's like, hey, land ho. We've got we can see it. It's coming. You're and a land it, ho. It really does put you in like a kind of a timer mode where you're like, oh shit, how many do we have? Three? Okay. L- uh, let's go. Let's keep playing. And then somebody goes, All right, sequence B. And you're like, oh no, I only got two more. And then you look at the dice. You've got two dice, but somebody else only has one dice and another person has none. And you know that you're not gonna be able to get everything you want done done and it puts that pressure on at the end which was really interesting yeah it's much cooler than like a sand timer or mm-hmm. something or just your everyday round tracker. round tracker like it's something that's a little bit more interactive and it's just a really neat aspect and you know with today's episode that's what i kind of wanted to talk about is not only different games that have cool boards but how they're used and Dalton and i already kind of talked about this topic before the episode and we both have kind of differing opinions on how those games, how those boards can be used in the game. We do have a little bit. So there's several other games that uh, we discussed, or at least a few other games, that also have interactive boards in some manner, whether it be player-controlled or if it's one of those where it's interactive but it's game-controlled. Uh, the two main examples for that I'm thinking of is player-controlled is Steam Up, which we've talked about, and game-controlled would be something like Tolkien, the Mayan Calendar where those gears rotate. You don't control that. That's not a player's choice. That just happens every turn kind of thing, right? And with Seasons too, right? Uh, Seasons has something to make. It's not the board. It's just uh, something moves around a board, not the board actually moving. Ah, okay. Yeah. It's really hard to think of games where the board itself is somehow being interacted with, whether it be triggered by something or you controlling it. It's like harder and harder for me to come up with something of like, oh, this one and oh, this game and oh, that game. Really, the three that stuck out to us the most were Black Angel, Steam Up, and... Tolkien. Tolkien, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could you could put in something like even Ginkopolis, where you can cover tiles with other tiles, and there's interactions from all the players on the board itself, and tile lane games kind of do that. But that doesn't quite feel the same, you know, in, in that sense. But yes, there's a couple ways you can kind of look at it. Something that I like, and I like it in, I like an element within interactive boards whenever it's sort of a type of luck or a type of, not luck, a type of chance or randomness that isn't controlled by the players. And I like that in terms of like Sulkin, because Sulkin, yes, it's not really random because you know the direction it's turning, you know how much it's turning. I don't remember when it triggers. It's been a long time since I've played. But I enjoy in that game that every single person has to watch those gears turn. Every person is manipulated by those gears. And you have to play it to your advantage. But it adds a random, or a, a, a chance kind of thing. It adds a, something different, something unique that you all have to try to figure out together but separately. And I find that to be fun. And in Black Angel, uh, in Black Angel, I enjoy that movement, that how things fall off and it comes back and you flip and go back to the front and it's, well, what news coming out? What's the order in it? Or, and, and whatever. And yes, it can be triggered by somebody, by their you know, sequence B turn where they're resetting. But it also, again, it feels like this thing that everyone has to do it at some point. You're trying to plan for when they're doing it and watching and, and recognizing that. And it's not necessarily random for Black Angel, but I don't there's something about that where everyone has to put up with the same thing that's fun for me and entertaining because it doesn't feel as targeted. And so I feel like Black Angel's a good little middle ground for the both of us because yeah. I like more the player interaction, which is why I like the board changes of Steam Up. 
because in Steam Up, you can choose on most of your actions if you are going to move the board. If you move the board, you can move some Steam Baskets into your spot or away from an opponent's. And so you have much more control over the board movement there. And so I like that because you get to be, I think I said in that episode, you get to be a little ornery. And in Black Angel too, like Delt said, you know, we're all having to face the consequences of, you know, taking option B. We're all going to have to, you know, watch as our ship progresses forward. That can mess up our plans. But you can also take some initiative and push the game along a little quicker. And so Delton actually ended the game before I could get some of the tasks that I wanted to get done done. And so that was able to get him some points to where he won the game. And it was great. Yes. And so I feel like Black Angel is like that good middle ground between the both of us and what we like when it comes to uh, the movement of the board. You like more of the, the random, when we're, we're all in this together, we're all affected. And I'm much more of the honorary person like, who we're all affected, but me for good, because I manipulated it. Yeah, Black Angel really... So, like you said, Steam Up, you can either directly benefit yourself or directly hurt an opponent with the rotations of the little Lazy Susan. Most of the time, you're not hurting your opponent. It's kind of pointless. However, that is a possibility. Black Angel is the good middle ground, like you said, because everybody's going to be doing it, but you can kind of choose to do it early or not, or, hey, if I go ahead and do my sequence B, rather than purchasing someone's die, I can rush this toward the end and prevent Haley from having another turn. Like, there's that kind of element. Uh, so it's, it, But it's only there really at the end more than anything. And then Sulkin is the exact opposite of those. Or not exact opposite, but further to that end of, this is going to happen. It's going to do it all the time, and you just have to put up with it. Just like our heads are on opposite ends of the size spectrum, our love of games is on opposite sides of the same spectrum. There's, a, there's at least a little bit of con, uh, uh, overlap in the Venn diagram. For us, it's we have heads, and for board games, it's we have board games. <laughs> That's what it yes, is. makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Uh, I, I wish I had more examples of interactive player boards or game boards where the actual board itself is interactive. I like it. I think this this differs a lot from, you know, a few episodes we talked about gimmicks in games. Yeah. And yes, Steam Up, the Steamer Basket, and the Lazy Susan, that's a gimmick. But again, it's something that's incorporated into the gameplay. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, us talking about the interactive boards, like it separates it from the gimmicks, but it also makes the game stand out because, yeah, Black Angel would be a really great game if it didn't have that component, but that just moves it up a level. It does add something to it aside from production and in on you cost, but they could do it in a multitude of different ways, but it really does add a level to the game, table presence and fun and story kind of all wrapped in that one thing of just flipping a tile and moving it to the front, flipping a tile and moving it to the front. We're going to space. We're going to space. Uh, but yeah, interactive game boards are really fun. I wish I had more examples of them. I'm sure I could Google it. Oh, Photosynthesis is the last one that I was thinking of. Uh, if you haven't played Photosynthesis, I recommend it at two players, no more, because no more. it's very, very, very slow with more than two. But at two, it's perfect. It's a fun game. It's about growing trees. And there's a little board that circles the player board. So that's in a way, it's not the board being interactive, but kind of. And again, you can't control it. But this board is replicating the sun moving throughout the different parts of the sky throughout the day. And when it's on one side, taller trees block smaller trees. When it gets a, a, to the exact opposite side, guess what? The smaller trees can now get the light that the big trees were blocking before. And it's just a fascinating element to the game. It's a fun, uh, it's a fun little like theme. I just like that. But being able to move that around and plan for when the sun's going to come around it's interactive, even if not player controlled, but I think that's also kind of qualifies. That's the most, I guess not the most. It's kind of like Sulkin. It's on the same level of. It's the furthest on your spectrum. It's going to happen. Yeah. Accept your fate. Accept your fate. And mine is, I control fate. Exactly. Well, let's move to the question here to wrap this up because I've got some editing to do. And some mowing to do. Maybe. And now, join us. For a Malt House Games podcast special, bite size question. So, the question for today to wrap this up is very simple. What 
this comes from Haley. What was your favorite critter or animal or aminal that you saw on our Alaskan vacation? For me, I really want to say something large and majestic like the dolphins or the, the minky whales whale. or the humpback whale. But I think that the thing that caught me off guard and surprised me and filled me with the most joy was seeing the mottled starfish. Really? So we were walking along the coast outside of Huna slash Icy Strait Point in Alaska. Yep. And the tide is low, and we decide to go out for an adventure. And we see little clams everywhere shooting up water. There's little baby crabs. But what surprised me the most, and I don't know why, like I just didn't expect to see this. I'm not really familiar with Alaskan waters. But there are pink and blue and green and brown and orange starfish everywhere. So many in the little tide pools. And they were just absolutely beautiful. I was not expecting that. And then Delton saw a little baby sturgeon swimming around. There were some little sturgeon. I couldn't get my phone to focus on them. But it was just gorgeous. And it was so surreal to see in this cold weather in Alaska, America, these vibrant, gorgeous starfish so close. That's a really good one. I mean, we saw a lot. The little otters were fun and cute. The one seal that we saw just floating on his back right by the boat was neat. Just chilling, judging us. All the dolphins that we saw toward the, what was it, the last day on the boat. Like, we got to see a bunch of stuff, but I think the one that was, uh, this is going to sound very Murica, but uh, the bald eagles that we saw at Icy Strait. It was when we ported at Icy Strait Point. We got there at night. We woke up the next morning, and we opened the windows, and there's just a bald eagle flying around. Like, right there. And we're like, what the hell? There were and two, because there was a nest. Yeah, we ended up seeing that there was a nest, and the thing's huge, way up in the tree, and you could watch, but see both their heads as they were sitting in it. And then one would fly around. And it's just one of those animals that we've seen, you know, in Portland at the zoo. We've seen at different zoos and things like that. But I've never seen one, tr truly seen one in the wild. And so it was very, very cool to see one just right there. And it obviously the same with the whales, like, there was a lot of cool animals, but I think just seeing seeing that, seeing a bald eagle at its nest and flying around right by us was just really cool. So we're very grateful for that adventure. Thank you, Riley, for giving us your travel agent discount and taking us on an adventure. And thank you, Delton, for not listening to my cheap ass whenever I said, let's just get an interior room surprising me with the balcony. Yeah, we, uh, we had an interior room booked, and me and Riley said, hey, let's book a balcony, surprise Haley. A little extra money will be fine. And so we did. And then they ended, uh, ended up doing a thing where it's like a, I'm going to say it's a raffle, but basically you say, hey, I'll pay this much money for an upgrade. And they pick so many people and you pay like a fraction of the cost to upgrade to a nicer room. So we were uh, upgraded for a very low cost to a mini suite, which had a pullout couch and a balcony. So Riley had a pullout couch rather than a little drop down bed which the couch didn't really pull out. It was just like a weird fold-up thing. And we also had the drop-down bed above her. We could have done double-decorated it. We could have had a fourth person. Uh, but it was very nice having a bigger room and worth the extra expense and having the balcony to sit on. Or I mean, half the time we just left the door open to listen to the ocean and look at everything. But it was very, very fun. Really liked that trip. Uh, also really liked Black Angel, which we played before the trip and had it planned to, to do this, but we had to record everything else in the meantime. We're also really grateful for our Patreon backers. We are. So thank you so much to our Patreon patrons that support us on the level in which they get shouted out on the podcast. Thank you so much to Alan, Jennifer, and Cliff. Thanks to all of our other Patreon patrons as well. The podcast is only possible because you people are awesome. Uh, I do need to... Uh, shout out because I need to add this in the beginning if I remember to or find a way to and I might just leave it here I don't know yet uh, but there is a kickstarter going right now from adversary gaming collective called static blood moon static blood moon and the little gurple meeple pieces uh, is a game that we got to try whenever we went to bgg con was it year before last year before last wait yeah. That would have been 21. They didn't do it in 21. 2020? No, they did it in 21. Did they? They didn't do it in 2020, but they did in 21. Okay, so it was in 21. We got to meet Jacob and his wife from Adversary Gaming Collective, and they had Static Blood Moon, which is a two-player game that's like a, uh, it's a dice drafting, dice placement kind of puzzly game, 
and we really enjoyed it. It was very cute, a very interesting game, but they have officially launched their Kickstarter. Uh, and I, let me see, I have backed it on there, but you can find it on Kickstarter. Just search Static Blood Moon. They were with the Strongbox Games guys from out of Tulsa, kind of in a very similar booth space, sort of sharing a booth. And I'm glad we got to talk to them all and play their games. But yeah, so go check out Static Blood Moon. And we'll share it on social media too. get the word out. It was a really fun game. It was fun. I'm very excited to see the final product and all that kind of stuff. But yes, aside from that, if there's any, I guess, anything else, if there's questions you have, any of that kind of crap, email, <laughs> email us, contact at malthousegames.com. I'll figure this out one of these days. <laughs> you can find us on social media at Malthouse Games. You can find Haley at S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-Y-G-E-K. I think that's going to cover everything. That's at Squirrely Geek. Yep. And I'm, you also didn't smell at Malt House. I'm tired. <laughs> I let you take a nap when you got home. Yes, I'm still tired. You took a nap for like an hour and a half laying with Margaret and Penny while I slept over a hot stove as your hot wife in this hot weather making you curry. Come on, you better scurry because it's 916 <laughs> and you got to edit this bitch and you also have to mow the lawn. <laughs> I'm not mowing tonight. It's dark outside now. Uh, but anyway, we'll get used to this again, this process. Uh, we are going to be doing our next episode before we go to Portland. To Gen Con. And I believe it releases, it'll release the weekend we're getting to Portland, right? Yes. We'll get there Friday. It comes out Sunday. So we'll record our next one before we go see our dear friends, Nick and Jennifer, and also see Mark. We're so excited to see everyone again. Yeah. And Jasper. And Jasper. But we'll get to go do that. This episode will release when we're going up there, and then we'll have another episode. I guess it's the week after we get back, so we'll have time to record after our trip theoretically speaking theoretically we'll probably speaking. still wait till the last minute most likely because we're good at that but i think that covers everything so thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the malt house games podcast until next time sit back relax grab a drink and play some games see you folks later bye bye